Thank you, Rod. My name is Adam Hastings. I'm an anaesthetist at Westmead Hospital, and I have a strong interest in both cardiac and neuroanesthesia, and more recently, a particularly strong interest in intraoperative neuromonitoring. I, um, I've been appointed as the course coordinator of the postgraduate clinical neurophysiology degrees within the university. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit now about how the clinical neurophysiology degrees are structured, how we came about putting them together and what we hope to achieve with the different, uh, the different subjects that we have on offer. As my uh, role as the course coordinator, I'm ably assisted by Ms. Ruth Bunby, who is um, a neurophysiology scientist also working at Westmead and together we've tried to tailor this, this course to as many people as possible. So just a little bit of background. Neurophysiology is, has been around for a very long time and there are multiple techniques that we can use to monitor patients for, and, and, and use as diagnostic tools. Um, and the use of these neurophysiology techniques is increasing um, particularly for procedural guidance intraoperatively, helping the surgeons to determine when they've achieved what they want to achieve, um, especially in neurological surgeries, and for nervous system monitoring during high-risk procedures, for example, during uh, scoliosis spine surgeries where the uh, spinal cord is at risk during what is ostensibly um, a, a realignment procedure for bony structures. Traditionally, neurophysiology has been a subspecialty of neurology, although this is really changing in the, in the last five to ten years, uh, and it's definitely growing out of being a, a neurological subspecialty. It's now frequently utilised in its different forms um, intraoperatively for anaesthetic and procedural guidance. It's used in intensive care settings for diagnosis and prognostication, and can be used, used in emergency settings, as well as being used in a traditional form as a diagnosis diagnostic tool as both inpatient and outpatient services often done in, in large tertiary hospitals. Unfortunately, um, the major problem that we've faced is that there has been very little formal training opportunities for, for clinical neurophysiology in Australia for the development of these schools outside of the opportunities that are provided to neurology trainees as part of their physician training and subspecialty training. Indeed, recently most of, um, of the on the, most of the training that's been available has been on-the-job training um, with education that's been provided by peers who are somewhat more experienced in these techniques. However, um, the, the these procedures are becoming increasingly complex and certainly the demand for service is growing to the point where the informal training opportunities cannot keep up um, with providing enough trained people to, to meet the requirements for, for service. Um, and that's largely because there's an, there's an increase in, in the demand for these services by particularly surgeons who see that this is becoming standard of care. Um, and the increased reliance on these techniques for therapeutic decision-making intraoperatively has really placed some practitioners at risk um, legally when they're, they're making decisions and informing surgeons, um, however, don't have any formal training opportunities to show for these, uh, for these decision-making abilities. So in putting together this course, we've had to think about the fact that that people who work in clinical neurophysiology work in, in a number of different settings and they come from a wide range of backgrounds. And this includes neurophysiology scientists, physicians, particularly neurologists, anaesthetists and other critical care practitioners. And most of these practitioners utilize only a subset of all the available techniques. And those techniques that they used are employed in a fashion and interpreted in a fashion that is appropriate to their usual clinical context, even though those techniques can be employed and used in a slightly different fashion in a different context. So we've tried to allow um, overlapping course pathways that allow individual candidates to tailor the course to meet their needs in terms of the, the techniques that they use, the sort of patients that they usually interact with, and the clinical environment in which they normally function. So we've put together a series of subjects, and these are the stream-specific subjects for the clinical neurophysiology degrees. 
I've shown here a list of all the subject names and I'll run through them in a minute. And on the right hand side is an indication of when those subjects are going to be first available. Um, these these uh, semester dates are tentative in some regards, but this is certainly what we're, what we're planning for, for the introduction of these subjects. So just running through them, the basic sciences in clinical neurophysiology is an introductory subject. It's considered core knowledge and it is um, a mandatory subject for all students unless they can demonstrate a, a, a um, justification for exemption. It covers the basics of neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and the use of the construction, the use and the principles underlying um, tools for electrodiagnostic work. Introduction to clinical epidemiology is a pre-existing unit offered through the um, School of Public Health. Uh, and this is an important unit for those uh, people wishing to do higher level degrees. So certainly the graduate diploma and the master's level. Um, this is a, a, a well set up and, and well delivered unit that has been uh, very well received. Diagnostic and electroencephalography is the basic EEG unit. Uh, it's, the it's the unit that introduces diagnostic EEG and it is really aimed at those people who do EEG monitoring and EEG diagnostic procedures for inpatients and outpatients, not in the intraoperative environment, certainly in the, in the ward or in the outpatient environment. It uh, hopes to cover all the different techniques, all the different setups and techniques of, of doing EEG monitoring, as well as covering the underlying pathologies and the pathological appearances in EEG that you would expect to see in general practice. Neuromonitoring in anesthesia is a subject that's been created to cover the techniques that are used in a, on a regular basis to provide monitoring of patients undergoing general anesthesia for any procedure, not necessarily a procedure in which neurological structures are particularly at risk. So this includes things like basic intraoperative EEG monitoring and processed EEG monitoring, neuromuscular transmission monitoring, uh, infrared spec uh, regional oximetry monitoring, and other techniques that we would use on a regular basis. It is a subject that is of interest to anybody who works in the intraoperative environment, whether or not they're an anaesthetist, but is certainly of interest to, uh, could be of interest to uh, people of, of an anaesthetic um, background who are doing the critical care uh, courses. Intraoperative monitoring one, which will be followed by intraoperative monitoring two later in the core structure, looks specifically at the techniques, the utilization of those techniques and the interpretation of the techniques used for monitoring nervous, sy nervous system structures at risk during both neurological and ne non-neurological surgery. The first unit, Intraoperative Monitoring 1, covers each of the techniques in their basic form, it looks at them in, as individual techniques and allows a really good understanding of how those techniques can be used. Whereas intraoperative monitoring too looks a little bit more closely at the combination of techniques, rational test decision, uh, test choice, and how to use these techniques in an intercalated way to best monitor and, and, and assure the safety of your patient. The clinical neurophysiology technique subject is one that is designed to cover all the non-EEG techniques that are used on a diagnostic level in inpatient and outpatient services. So this would include things like nerve conduction studies, evoke potentials, um, and anything else that you would expect to, to provide in a neurophysiology lab. It will largely cover many of the of the techniques that are covered in the intraoperative monitoring course uh, subjects. However, these techniques are dealt with as they are utilized in a diagnostic lab rather than during an intraoperative course. And the last subject listed here, advanced encephalography, follows on from diagnostic encephalography for those who look after more complicated and advanced patients. And these will include things like 
uh, EEG monitoring in pediatric patients, stereotactic EEG and depth EEG monitoring, and video long-term video EEG monitoring for seizure diagnosis. Um, we look forward to introducing each of these subjects to you. I would also point out that the subjects that have an asterisk next to their name have a face-to-face -face practical component associated with them. And we are acutely aware that people undertaking this course come from a, a wide range of, of areas and certainly can be geographically dispersed. And as such, we've tried to concentrate those face-to-face -face times down into one to two day blocks for each of those subjects. Uh, we certainly don't expect that you would be having to attend the university on a regular basis. There are a number of elective subjects which are available to those people doing the um, graduate diploma and master's level courses. And these show significant overlap with the uh, um, subjects available in the critical care courses. And this allows each of our candidates to tailor their course to suit their own interests and then suit their own needs. And certainly if there are subjects in the clinical neurophysiology core subject lists that are not of interest in when trying to put together a master's degree, there are a number of electives here that allow you to broaden the, the range of education while still completing that same degree. And we can see here certain several units about pain and leadership in medicine and communication and research and biostatistics. So we've put together a couple of suggested course path pathways based on the environment in which the candidates find themselves working. For those who work in the non-operative environment, so usually in a diagnostic lab, we suggest the non-operative pathway where you undertake the basic sciences in neurophysiology subject, being the, um, the non-elective subjects, which is the core presumed knowledge, and follow that with diagnostic EEG and the advanced EEG subject when it becomes available and associate that with the clinical neurophysiology techniques. This gives four subjects that are all suitable for people who work in that diagnostic environment and is, is enough to um, meet the requirements of the graduate certificate. Certainly for further ongoing study at the diploma and master's level, additional subjects can be added as required. For those undertaking work in the operative setting, we would suggest the basic sciences unit followed by the neuromonitoring and anesthesia and both the intraoperative monitoring units one and two. And this provides a good global um, education in those techniques that are used to monitor patients in the operative setting. Again, for further study at, at diploma and master's level, additional subjects can be added in. There's certainly room for crossover with subjects that uh, indicate that are that are that have been generated for the non-operative field. And there's also the um, introduction to clinical epidemiology unit, which is mandatory for the graduate diploma and master's level and all the other elective subjects that were previously mentioned. So we really do hope that candidates can have the ability to tailor the course themselves. The introduction to clinical epidemiology unit is a, is a fantastic subject and notably it is required for college accreditation both in ANSCA and uh, the Emergency College and it is a required subject for those students undergoing, undertaking graduate diploma and master's level courses. There is definitely the, the option for dual field training in which both non-operative and operative subjects can be covered and, and um, that provides the vast majority of the subject requirements for a master's level course. And we have discussed that there are, se there are several elective units available that allow you to tailor the course to your own interests. So I'd like to hand over now to Ms. Ruth Bunby, one of my very dear colleagues, and she'd like to just discuss where this all fits in with the scientific world and, and, and how this course is applicable to to people working as scientists and technicians in the clinical neurophysiology field. Thank you, Ruth.